Hello everyone that's joining me today on this wonderful video of mine. Uh, today we will be speaking to Eleanor Greenberg as well as <clears throat> Karen, how do I pronounce your last name? Arluck. Arluck, I just wanted to make sure. And uh, we are family here, right, between Eleanor and Karen. So I, I'm not sure if that's something you want to mention, but uh, that's something to mention. And uh, we are um, needing you to introduce yourself slightly for anybody that maybe is unfamiliar with who you two are. I'm sure many are already familiar with Eleanor <laughs> if they've watched any of the other videos I've done, but uh, go right ahead. A little introduction could be of use. I'm Eleanor Greenberg, Dr. Eleanor Greenberg, licensed psychologist. And what I enjoy is working with people with personality adaptations, what are usually called personality disorders. And I got very interested in schizoid because I didn't have an intuitive knowledge of it. And then when angst invited me to be on, I've written on the topic. I have a theoretical knowledge and I have schizoid clients, but I thought what a wonderful opportunity to get firsthand experience outside of the therapy room with people. And I very much enjoyed it and it's been working out really well for me. And I have a book out, Borderline Narcissistic and Schizoid Adaptations, The Pursuit of Love, Admiration, and Safety, that is available on Amazon, and it's available in German. And this tells you something about how important it is that we get more knowledge about people with schizoid adaptations or zoids, is that in Germany, and some of you will know this, they made me take out the word schizoid from the title, and it's called borderline und narcissismus. And their objection wasn't to be people being schizoid. It was that they thought that their audience wouldn't buy it, that they didn't know enough about schizoid. And they would think I was talking about schizophrenia or that this was for medical people only. So that's why I'm here <laughs> to, make, um, to make this a better uh, known topic, to get more therapists involved and to uh, meet Zoids. There we go. All right, wonderful. And today we have Karen as well, a uh, little introduction, uh, if you will. I'm Karen Arlock. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in private practice. So I'm a psychotherapist and I specialize in personality disorders also, specifically uh, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and schizoid personality disorder. And people with the themes, uh, flavors, I like to call them. Um, and one of the things that I find is that there really is not enough knowledge about this. There are um, many people, a, a lot of my clients who first come to me, especially with SPD, think that they're the only person who has this and feel very much, um, you know, that, that there weren't other enough there's just not enough knowledge, you know, commonly where it's not something people talk about enough uh, or understand well enough. So I'm hoping to be a part of the conversation because I really love what you do in terms of uh, making more knowledge more accessible for people. I'm trying. I'm trying my best. It's an uphill battle half the time, but I'm doing what I can. Uh, Burb is here with us. Everyone is probably uh, already familiar with Burb. Hi, Burb. Hello. And Burb will be helping me by keeping me on track because I tend to go off into non secutors constantly. Burb uh, will go ahead and get us started. Am I right on that one, Burb? Um, yeah, I mean, I just sort of wanted to begin by sort of catching up uh, the audience to some of how our dialogue has changed over time. Um, and so, I mean, I have some thoughts about that and what I've learned from our conversations. Um, uh, Angst, do you want to go first? Your Greenberg, do you want to go first? Um, um, well, I mean, just, just to clarify, what uh, Burb, Burb is referring to all the conversations we've been having outside of this, well, these types of conversations outside and the behind the scenes, essentially, uh, yeah. of a lot of uh, the, the topics at hand. And it's developed significantly. The conversations have developed significantly since uh, even the last video I had done with uh, Dr. Eleanor. Um, so uh, I think uh, I think if you want to start or anybody else wants to start, it'll actually I'll help start. me. 
Go I'll for start. it. Um, one of the interesting things is I take one piece of information and I work with it for a very long time before I'm ready to take another piece of information. And you guys offered me something that crystallized. I had been seeing it, but I hadn't been seeing it. I didn't know what I was seeing and reacting to. And that was um, Burp helped, you helped. And between the two of you, you got me oriented to when does my clients start talking in abstractions and away from the personal. And the value of meeting them at the level of abstraction where they currently are, or finding some intermediary, intermediary level of extra, abstraction that uh, is reachable by both of us. And so I've been paying much more attention to that. And sometimes it's just silent attention. I, I'm not announcing, hey, you just went abstract on me. But yeah, actually, that, that might make things awkward, if anything. <laughs> but some of my clients, I work with mostly high functioning people. And they, they have more, some of them have more of a tolerance for actually talking about what's going on. And that in itself is abstracting enough. Mm -hmm. and, but now I just watch the ups and downs, the scale. And if I go personal and they go up, then I stop personal and I try and meet them at their level of abstraction. So our categorization so thank you for that. I'm still a, you know, a neophyte at it, but I expect to get better and to learn things from today. I'm ready for another piece. I got the abstraction, I got generalizations. And so that's what I'm currently working to understand better. Mm -hmm. And- Well, and, and, and you said you've been putting it to, to some use in your actual practice, right? And mm -hmm. you've been seeing some interesting kind of results inside yourself as far as like what you're noticing what you're seeing and uh the type of directions maybe they take their speech in i i really like that you mentioned um moving up and down with them because uh the 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 process of um helping that individual doesn't have to stay in that personal realm um it, that, that i guess that therapeutic process could extend itself into layers that are unfamiliar maybe even to the uh the uh the clinical uh, psychologist or therapist uh, that is trying to help them. And if they're able to go up and down with them like that, they can reach those places that otherwise would be unreachable. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting. And I, and I appreciate uh, any efforts you've done so far, especially with whatever clients you work with now. Um, and I did have a question for you. Oh, yeah. have, you can I answer all the questions you want, so it's all good. Uh, Karen, anytime you want to insert yourself, feel free. Um, I had noticed some, yeah, you're gonna. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I also loved, uh, the, your concept of abstraction and I'm, my mom and I had been talking about it at length and it's something that I had been playing with and using in session with clients and also finding really helpful. And in fact, with some of my clients who, um, felt com comfortable enough um, I introduced the idea to them of abstraction and asking them if this resonated for them mm -hmm. and explored it with them. And some of them really, really uh, liked it and found it incredibly useful to then work on noticing how abstracted are they in that moment or how much abstraction are they, you know, using or um, even if at times maybe it felt safer after the fact to look back at a conversation maybe they had with me or with someone else a day ago and looking at the level of abstraction and that that could also be uh, an entry point for noticing what might have been happening for them emotionally if that was harder to access. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I, I, I'm just if I ever stay quiet, it's because I'm really thinking deeply about people's words. So <laughs> I always like to um, uh, to mention that um, I'm thinking about how it is that you're experiencing it. I'm trying to think about uh, the setting, the uh, psych, uh, you know, uh, the therapeutic setting for how that could be used and how you're implementing it. And it's interesting because it's it's really odd for me to hear not odd, but 
in, insight, inspiring, I guess, to hear uh, somebody <clears throat> in the field actually implementing some of these ideas that me and Burb were working with. So that's nice to hear. That is nice to hear. Uh, Burb. Um, uh, we, Greenberg had a question. So oh, Greenberg did have a question. Yeah. See, there you go. It wasn't that about abstraction, though. It was about that's fine. I don't care. something that I've, I've, I've um, noticed with my clients, my Zoid clients, mm -hmm. not every single person. And Karen and I have discussed a bit because I believe she's noticed it too. And uh, someone came in the other day and they wanted to know what was my plan for their therapy and how were they going to get from where they are here to where they are there. And they wanted a, a distinct pathway and they were trying to figure out how much money this would cost them because <laughs> they were an issue. And so they, they felt like there was a path and that I should tell them what the path is. And so I mean, actually, I, I, I've had, had that question enough where, and I knew this person well enough where they had mm -hmm. given me enough cues. We yeah. had had conversations and there were issues on it that uh, like perfectionism and things like that. And uh, that I could address and I knew, I knew possible paths. But mm -hmm. do you find that that was... Uh... Uh, if that's a common thing or something that people mention yeah. or yeah yeah um actually i've heard this mentioned a few times um that it's one of the reasons a lot of and there's a there's a few that are, are there's there's a mix of schizoids out there that have more or less of a trust and um uh it, with institutions right and, and uh, people attempting to help them or them looking for help. That's, I mean, that's probably why many of the reasons you don't hear a lot of uh, people with this uh, situation actually go out and look for help or seek help. Uh, many times they try to say that the reason they don't seek help is because it's some aspect of the PD or whatever, or the adaptations themselves. Uh, a lot of the times it's because that person's experience um, will feel invalidated in most clinical settings. Uh, and because of uh, some of these issues of where they take their language, where they go with their thoughts, the places that they're comfortable speaking around, and then oftentimes the clinical setting forcing them back to the, to the more concrete, right? Forcing them back to places in which their emotions aren't necessarily tied. And so they feel invalidated, they feel disconnected from those sessions. And so it builds up for many of them a distrust of institutions, of psychologists, of therapists, and things like that. And so uh, it's interesting to hear you say that somebody wanted something, everything laid out. And part of the reason is to kind of build a sense of trust because sometimes there's this issue of, okay, I don't want you to do things to try and get me places. I want to know where you're taking me and why you're taking me. I want to, they're essentially trying to look at the meta of the situation they're actually in. So they're abstracting almost out of the session itself by wanting to look at the, the process of, psych, of therapy or, psych, the, or psychology being uh, used on them, right? They want to see- Can I interject? Can I interject here? Yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So um, there's like, when, I, when I'm looking at, there's two things that I'm seeing when I'm when I'm looking at this situation and you notice that it's not all of them, right? It's not like a universal, universal trait, which, no. which right. makes a lot of sense because it, there's, you're combining it. Like there's two different things sort of happening here. I think um, one is that it's really common for people who are neurodiverse um, to uh, experience some form of unintentional neglect. Um, and then that unintentional neglect um, can be, interpreted as it, into the person um, and then carried forward and externalized in the world as if other people um, are both unwilling and unable to, to help them, right? So there's this essentially lack of trust in the competence of, of other people or the willingness to, to, for other people to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you combine that with a natural, um, a natural interest in psychological topics, because psychological topics are, what are the things that go wrong across multiple domains of human activity, right? What are the things that can go wrong for bricklayers and also for engineers and technicians and also for people who, you know, write music together, right? 
those are really psychological questions. And those are the kind of questions that fascinate schizoids in the same way that, you know, you'll find lots of uh, autistic engineers, you'll find lots of little schizoid psychologists. And as you've noticed, when schizoids diagnose themselves, they are almost always correct. So I think you're noticing these two facets coming together in this presentation, which is one is an interest in the process, which is, which is uniquely schizoid in their, uh, their interest in psychology, wanting to understand how, exactly how it works, right? And, and in association wanted, yeah. to their own experience, right? Yeah, so. wanting, to, wanting, to, wanting to get into your head as you do the job, because they kind of want to do the job, because it's in, in a, inherently interesting for them. And the second part is this um, lack of trust in the competence of institutions um, mm -hmm. Uh, for, 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 for multiple reasons. So ho hopefully that, that's many, helpful. many, many I valid. I have yeah, to yeah. say. Yes. Yes. Actually, this person, you know, speaks about her lack of trust very freely on other people who have done this, you know, are pretty open about that. And often Good. they've had a prior, some have had a prior therapy experience that went nowhere because the person was essentially counseling them without any, um, adaptation to them and what was going on in their brain or without knowing their diagnosis. And it's just a big difference between coaching, counseling, and actually doing psychotherapy uh, in a specialized way where you've actually studied the person and then you're trying to adapt it specifically, not to every person that might be a Zoid, but to this person with their history and their set yes. of strengths. And so, um, something I'd like to bring up as well is, because uh, I mean, the, psycho the psychological community or the therapy community in general is very divided. Uh, there's a lot of schools of thought. There's a lot of, uh, you, know, you know, like yourself, you're gestalt. And then there's other people that don't like that. And then there's people that do. And there's other ones that think this type of psychotherapy or that type. And so certain types of schools um, produce a different kind of therapist. And oftentimes certain types of therapy can prove to be especially potent in its inability to um, kind of work with this type of client, right? And, uh, and I find that interesting too. Like, for example, uh, when I brought up some of your own ideas uh, or some of like my, 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 my own psychologist's ideas, which are more holistic, more humanistic and, and so on and so forth, those types of things generally sound a lot more appealing to the people I discuss it with because oftentimes when they describe their own experiences with uh, things like that, they're, they're dealing with other forms of psychotherapy that heavily, heavily focus on things like trauma. And sometimes the trauma um, you know, associated with their childhood isn't necessarily what's causing uh, many of the issues that get brought forward. And so the, um, the problem with that is that there's an insistence upon some therapists to want to push this idea that there every aspect of that individual's kind of eccentricities or idiosyncratic behavior and thinking has to do in some regard or another to something that occurred to them in their childhood. You you guys have shared, and so then uh, you know I had something to add to the sharing process before we would move into the next topic with an analogy that I yeah do it do it do it. Um, so what I learned and what actually helped me in my life directly um, from these conversations uh, is this idea of negotiating needs, right? Negotiating, actually negotiating rather than just leaving, right? Yeah, which wrong, is easy. Like, that, that's yeah, something yeah. Zoids are known for is leaving and ghosting yeah. and being like, yeah, fuck yeah. this, I'm out. Yeah. And the mechanism so. for that is simply, well, you know, when you perceive domains rather than individuals, when something goes wrong, you go, well, there's something wrong with the domain. So I'll just I'll know I'll navigate around the domain rather than navigating around the detail of the situation that's going wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a clear. Anyway, um, so uh, and this whole idea of negotiating needs is especially important when you're thinking about this in this neurodiverse, different kinds of brain function uh, model, uh, because if you have needs that are sort of out of the norm, right? If you have needs that are in the norm, most of the time you don't necessarily have to have to spell them out through each part of your life, you know, in explicit detail, because people have a general understanding of what people need most of the time based on repeated activities, right? But when you have needs that are not necessarily bad or pathological, but just out of the norm, um, and you're trying to, you're trying to, you know, have a relationship, if you don't negotiate, well, there's simply no way that the other person is going to know what to do, 
it just can't work, right? So negotiating needs is especially important if you if there's some sort of innate difference. Um, so that so that's been that's been helpful for me. Um, now the analogy, and this is what sort of what Angus was just talking about. Um, he, this he, we speak in analogies, but look, see what you think about this. Um, the experience of being schizoid when you're young, right? It's like you're placed in the world. If you imagine a city, um, it's a metaphorical city, um, and you know this, this activity is being ha happening uh, in this city, and you're placed in a very specific part of it. Um, and then what's, what what starts to happen is that not really in response to anything in particular, you start to like levitate and lift off. And as you lift off from the ground, you sort of leave other people behind, but you're looking down at them and you can see them, but you're not able to interact with them. And so then, but then you have a broader perspective of the landscape as you, as you sort of lift off and go higher and higher and higher. And then, so there might be something um, traumatic or something difficult or something stressful happening mm -hmm. in that environment as you start to lift off. And then that can increase the speed at which you lift off or the frequency, but it's not what's causing you to lift off, right? And the lifting off process itself is can be traumatic and confusing because there's nobody there explaining it to you. And so nobody there happen. regulating any yeah. of your feelings yeah. while it's happening yeah. as well. Yeah. Right, right. It's an, it's an invisible kind of suffering. Um, and you don't have language for it. And so what, and so, but here's what really happens that can go wrong is you start to lift off and have this broader and broader perspective and, and sort of fall up out of the world. And then when you come back down, other people punish you for having left. Mm -hmm. That's the really difficult part. Um, so then, th then that, that actually closes the window of you being on the ground, able to interact with people, right? It closes it. Every time you come down and you get punished for it, it closes just, it. Just to mention, um, an example of that would be, obviously, you go to a social event or you go to a place where family is or there's some kind of interaction that's taking place, whether it's interpersonal, one-on-one -on -one or otherwise, and then maybe you drift off, right, um, into certain thoughts or places. And so that turns into, you are ignoring me, you are ignoring the setting. You don't care about your family. You don't care about the setting and the traditions of this you know, environment, the society, this group, this, whatever, whatever the sitting is. So those are the types of punishments that oftentimes are, are inflicted upon a, a person that drifts off in this way or flies up and up mm -hmm. outward yeah. in this way. When they come back, they come back to castigation, scolding, shame, and all sorts of things like that. Go ahead. Sorry, Barb. And yeah. So to, con to, to, to continue, um, that, that sort of carried forward in, into the rest of into the rest of their life where uh they needed somebody to sort of know what was you know in a way to prepare them like in, in an example for autism which is which will be illuminating is uh it's similar in terms of the sensory crisis so kids with autism don't understand why they're in so much discomfort no one's there explaining it to them because nobody really knows right they don't have language to express their uh their pain um, and so then they're trying to explain their pain through the language that's being provided for them, but the language doesn't explain the thing that they're experiencing. Uh, and so it's very confusing and alienating. And so later in life, um, when they, when schizoids and autistics encounter, uh, therapists who are trying to figure out what it was that went wrong in the, in their, in their early environment to cause this thing to happen, right? They, they keep narrowing down and, they, but they keep missing it. And there's this sense of you're missing it, you're missing it, you're missing it. But I mm -hmm. don't have language That's to explain what you're missing. Said. Yeah, I don't yeah. have language to explain what you're missing. But you're neither missing party has important. language to explain. Yeah. And unfortunately, because of the amount of uh, the language in which the therapist is using in order to hone in on this, they're using one the incorrect language, and they're also honing in on the incorrect things. And then the client has no way of expressing outside of no, no, you're getting it wrong. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. That's not what I'm trying to do. And then uh, even more unfortunate that they get the person saying, that's not what I'm trying to say. That's not what I'm trying to do. And they include that in the pathology. 
or the, uh, the, the, path, the in the mind of the therapist, that's often included in the pathology of the individual, instead of sitting down and figuring out why it is that this person is saying that, no, that's not what I mean. That's not what I'm talking about. And so it becomes, oh, you're just trying to avoid, right? They start being told that they're merely trying to avoid something, or they're using this tactic of, of disassociating from the conversation of a certain type of topic by saying that it's not relevant because that's in fact the relevant thing when it's not. That's not what's, uh, what's causing them so much um, discomfort. I'm thinking about differences among people and um, what we work around. And I was wondering how is it different um, well, I understand pathologizing everything. I mean, not everything is, is, is that. But I work with clients sometimes for a very long time, decades. And some of my clients start out by whatever I say is the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And their explanation was, you know, it's help, the ones who continued working, it's helpful, but I would get one explanation for it in the beginning of therapy. Uh, no, what you're saying is not correct for me. And th it's really not that. And I, I, early on, to give an example, I had a, a, my, one of my first clients who came to me and told me that he was schizoid. And I mentioned him before and I said I knew nothing about the whole thing and he gave if he said if you will read books on and I'll stay with you so we were very open as much as we could with each other because he knew that I didn't know and I knew I didn't know and he also had autistic traits so in the beginning I'm going to switch from him to another which may be confusing his thing was I told him at the end of at the beginning of another session I said every time it seems like every time that I try and um, say something, you tell me I'm wrong. And I'm wondering if I'm, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing that's so off or whatever. It feels like I'm not helping you if, if everything I say is wrong and not quite it. And his first thing was, um, it's, you're helping me define myself. And I've said this before in an earlier one, but because then I realized, no, that's not it. And that in itself is helpful. Now, go forward decades later, and I have the same thing going on in someone's therapy, but it turns into, um, it goes from you're just wrong to, oh, I see how I'm keeping you out. I'm seeing that I don't even expect you to come in and therefore everything you're saying, I'm putting into a negative cast. Now we're really talking about it, a very advanced smart person and that I realize that I didn't realize it at the time, but when I looked at my notes from the session, because a lot of my clients take their own notes and I encourage that. So we both uh, so I'm not the note taker for them about what's important. They say, I realized looking at it a second time that um, it didn't even occur to me your real reasons for doing that. And that I was, autom I was doing something very automatically that goes back to my childhood when no one understood me. And it was like a you know, big light bulbs go off when something like that happens. So it's segued from, you've got me entirely wrong to, oh, I'm in defense. That's an old defense that I don't need with you. And I don't even realize I'm using to, that, that to interpret things only this way and not to be open and the person opened. So I've seen a range where of explanations for the phenomena and of course, there's a range of people. Um, I, I'd like to hear some of uh, Karen's thoughts on some of this as well, if you have any uh, that are, you know, you want to share. Sure. I was thinking along the same lines that I've had uh, some clients switch where um, initially there was a lot of everything I say is wrong or not quite there. It, it's not this, it's this. Uh, or and that as uh, we got to know each other better and they felt safer and sometimes that shorter periods, months, some, sometimes much longer, um, 
that they could then tell me, um, like even if I suggested or asked about something and they shut it down and said, no, no, that's not it at all, that the next session they could say to me, you know, um, I, I, I was angry and frustrated and I think I was automatically, you had to be wrong. It was too unsafe to say to you at that moment that you, that that could be possible or that that was going on. Um, and even, you know, that what I was saying, it was, you know, just too close. Um, and that they were reacting to me like I was just anybody in that moment, everybody else who was saying the wrong things, who was insensitive, who maybe had sadistic or malicious intent, who wouldn't really get it and wouldn't really understand. And in the moment of defense, I was like this other person and they were reacting to me as such. But then once they had sort of calmed down a bit and felt more closer to their emotional equilibrium, a little bit more balanced of where they like to be, in the next session, they were able to bring this up to me and say, you know, even though that's what I said, oh, here's the other piece. Even if, even when they say that, sometimes they'll say, I know I said no, but I want you to know that I still think about it. And sometimes I consider it after session and it plants a seed. And maybe this part wasn't on, but there was this other part of that that I thought about and here's where it rings true even though if I say no and then the third thing is sometimes they'll tell me that they they can't even think about it in my presence that it's too vulnerable to even introspect at that level in the presence of another person and that they may say no to get me to back off like the porcupine at that moment but then when they're alone, you know, it, it, in a way in, in the cave that feels safer, where there, are, there aren't other people maybe judging or looking in or whatever, you know, they're afraid of or have experienced, that then it's safe to consider and introspect alone and maybe talk about it after, but not during. So that was a little No, no, yeah, no, interesting. <laughs> that too i've had people in fact i i have an, a number of people in therapy who say when i ask them a question like how is the session going or what do you think give me some guidance they they shut they say i can't now i can't think um i will tell you next i will think about it at, afterwards and tell you next time so that i've heard that version of of that as well that just being in my presence in fact somebody wanted to only have in the beginning I used to do weekly and twice a week sessions with people and then with uh, COVID and other things it dropped every other week to fit in people I was seeing older and seeing fewer people and but early on somebody told me they wanted to only come every other week because it took them two weeks to process what we had talked about and that it was too intense for them a weekly session or certainly anything more so I had early found that my schizoid clients often preferred every other week for that reason, uh, so that they could control, uh, that was a way of controlling how much contact we made, how much time they had, without being able Burb, to negotiate it with me during the session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I do want to mention is that just, okay, so I want to, I guess, separate something that I said earlier is, um oftentimes yeah uh what i think is happening and i did it to myself with my own psych um is there is an avoidance of certain types of trauma and pain but that that trauma is not often associated to what the therapist at that time is just trying to discuss with me that's kind of what you were saying karen how they'll say this part uh, kind of makes sense, but, and then later they'll contemplate it and they'll process it because I think what often happens is like, for example, when it, in my case, right, um, the focus regarding trauma became, uh, you know, what occurred to me as a child, uh, my, um, uh, I guess, uh, being molested, right? And so because that was 
like a point of trauma, a time, right? I didn't quite understand where the trauma was there. But of course, there was there was pain there that was hard to discuss and it was hard to go over. But what my therapist at the time thought was the trauma wasn't exactly that. Right. And I've explained this. I'm not going to go super detailed into it again, but I've explained this before in other recordings. I think in the previous one we did together, uh, Eleanor. Um, so uh, we, there is a piece there in associating to that subject in which the trauma developed and it impacted my life. But oftentimes, because it's in this kind of abstract realm, uh, it, it is a different kind of trauma than it is w- what should be. Um, sought out, not sought after, but looked for by the person um, or dug into by the person that is trying to work with a client. Um, but anyway, that was just my, my thought on that. Burb, uh, would you like to add? About the question of, you know, what is this therapy going to look like? What's the methodology behind it? What's the plan of action? Where are we going? What's each step going to look like? Um, I think part of that um, is the fear of being changed in such a way that the schizoid has to be in their masking mode all the time, right? They're they're, they're expecting to be told, no, this is the way you have to be. That's nightmare fuel. (laughs) You have to be equidistant all the time. And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. Um, So they're trying to make sure that that's not going to happen, (laughs) right? Because that's so so concerning for them um, uh, as a possibility. Mention what equidistant is for the people that maybe come across this video that haven't seen our streams or or discussed. There's the concrete space of the fine details of the world. So there's the texture of the bed and there's the, you know, the the texture of bark on a tree um, and the, the details of the way my food tastes and, you know, the way I swing a hammer to drive a nail into a, right? And then there's, then there's the abstract space of concepts like building and construction and, and groups of people and philosophical concepts and all that. And then there's the in-between space, equidistant between two poles. Um, the, the equidistant space is the space of how I relate to you, right? How individuals, which are collections of activities, right? Relate to each other in, in relationships, right? In friendships and romantic relationships and um, just the interpersonal we, realm, the interpersonal space, the equidistant interpersonal space. Um, anyway, so uh, hopefully, hopefully that explains. Yeah, it. I, I think uh, that I think that's helpful. I think yeah, that should be yeah, enough. Yeah. yeah. So so anyway, mo- moving on back to this idea of being um, scared of being changed uh, in that way, result resulting in this sort of uh, these questions about what the therapy uh, is going to look like. I want to sort of segue off of this to talk about what it actually, what an answer to that question might be that will be satisfying. I think the goal, right, in terms of therapy for a schizoid, in terms of getting from what is a state of very unpleasant living to a state of Understatement like, of the century. Under, yeah, understand to, to a state of like more fulfillment and peace, less anxiety and stress and concern and confusion. Um, it's not, it's really not obvious to us that we can remain ourselves in all of the, these ways that we've been discussing and have a relationship at the same time. That's really not obvious. Right. And but the way that that actually practically looks in reality is that when we get there, we spend, you know, a good portion of our time drifting away from the world, as we always do. It's just that when we come back, there's somebody there, which is not how it was before. And so I was just talking to someone um, recently about this and they were talking about we were, we were sort of bonding over the fact that in conversations, we'll just be we'll just be there one second and then we're not the next. Right. And then, oh, we, yeah. then we come back and it's like, Oh, hello, I'm back again. Right. Right. And and that, just, that's when yeah. you get castigated oftentimes, especially right. if you're doing yeah. that to a romantic partner. Yeah. But um, to, be, to be understood, right. As a schizoid in a relationship is for the other person to not be upset about that, but to be happy that you're back. Right. Just to notice that you left and the, and the leaving wasn't of your volition. You didn't go, this was what I want to do. Right. It just happened. Uh, wow. And now you're back and you're glad to be back for the time that you are back. And so, well, then what that looks like in, a, you know, 
the structure of a practical life is that you're very much the way you were before because, I mean, it's very difficult to change personality. It's just that for the times where you're able to be interpersonal, for the times where you're able to be equidistant, there's a person there who's happy to engage in those activities with you and who won't be who won't be uh, very upset when you uh, in, inevitably are gone again. And, and um, even better if, if that's a person that is close enough and wants to expend the energy to <clears throat> drift off with you even to more tolerable levels for them when it does happen, right? Um, instead of the, the schizoid person just drifting off inside their own mind, they might be more willing to share those thoughts uh, if the person is you know, tolerant and interested in being there with them, right? And not taking it as an interruption of the interpersonal and then being castigated for it, right? Because oftentimes, like, uh, I'll give you an example of something that would happen to me. Uh, It would be conversations happening, very equidistant. Uh, A thought pops into my head. I start floating away. I start thinking about this. I lose track of the conversation. Whatever the topic was is interpersonal. And then I'll just blurt out my thoughts uh about like the meta aspects of the conversation itself or what it means or something like that and then instead of being told you're not paying attention or why what are you talking about that's not what we're talking about um if the person is willing to go there with them temporarily it it would actually make it a lot easier to come back than after and have enough energy and not come back and feel concerned for oh no oh no no um what were we talking about oh no if i don't remember this i'm going to be punished in some respect or another i better uh react to uh you know and so on and so forth and there's like a lot of anxiety and stress associated to that Um, but go ahead sorry uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think it was open it up to more discussion about about that answer. I mean, I guess just just, just to cap it off, um, I wish that I had been told that that was an option, and I would have pursued a relationship much quicker if anybody had told me that that was an option and help and given help me a path to communicate the language that we've had to develop to communicate, you know, what's going on to other people in a way that they can empathize, right? Like I would have had a relationship much earlier. I would have been much less alone. Right. With if I didn't, if I didn't, if we didn't have to work this out from the ground up for ourselves, right? Um, in terms of you know uh, maintain, maintaining the the strategies for for dealing with uh, schizoid c- cognition uh, and having a relationship at the same time, and the two not being mutually exclusive, right? Well, just look at what my life looks like right now, right? Like I spend most of my time in a room. Abstracting about all this stuff, right, on the server with people, uh, or 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 on my own, and then I'll come down occasionally, and then I have my partner there, and I for the times that I come down, uh, I spend with my partner, and I'm very uh, very happy to spend that time. Of course, you know I'm still just as schizoid as I ever was, <laughs> right? Just as withdrawn as I ever was. It's just that now there's a person there when I do come down. So and sometimes uh, all we need is that one person. Even well, yeah, that, that's, that's the important thing, too. It's even just, if they're not there physically, yeah. Uh, yeah. and even if it's not that intimate, it doesn't have to be a romantic uh, mm-hmm. relationship. Just having an individual that will be there in some regard in that aspect and will either join you in your abstracting or will respect your space when you're in those places if they can't or are unable to join. Well, that, that's um, the thing. Just having one, you know, just having one or two connections like that is a lot less intimidating than reintegrate with society, right? On a constant <laughs> basis, really, right? We really don't want to reintegrate with society. We really don't want to do that. It's just not feasible. Um, but uh, it must. It definitely is feasible to uh, to have you know a few of those really important connections develop and quite fulfilling and easy once the language is available. So, yeah. All right. Sorry. What are you guys' thoughts on all our rambling and? <laughs> explaining of our thoughts i'd like to hear eleanor's and karen's thoughts if any of that made sense in <laughs> anyway go ahead i think that makes a lot of sense you know both the uh, the punishment for leaving when really it's the coming back and the other person making it about the part the partner in question making it about their feelings or being angry and i think that giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, they don't understand. 
They, they have no, their absolutely. Own. I, and, I, and I bring that up all the time to, to yeah. people that get frustrated. I tell them they don't know, but go ahead. Explain your, that side of the story. I'd like to hear exactly. It. They don't understand. They're, they have their own schema of whatever pain they've had in their life. And now they're feeling, I don't know, they could be abandoned, ignored, all kinds of things, depending on, you know, one person's issues hits the other person's and then we have a, you know, a thing. And it's especially potent when one person is in a different place entirely, not just, they're not even in the same place with different problems. They're like in different places with different problems at the same yeah. time. Exactly. And I think, Burb, what you were saying about uh, the, the, the choice, to have that choice was so powerful for you. And also that, that the awareness, I think, of what was ha what's happening for you, of the drifting away and coming back, and just how amazingly important that can be, both having that and then orienting your partner to that so that they now learn okay here's what this means this isn't about me it's not about you know whatever they're reacting to or or punishing that this is about what you need and this is about your pattern and that the more they're able assuming the person is empathetic and cares you know um that they're a lot usually better able to adjust once they're um, oriented to what's going on and what it means and, and given some tools. Yeah. Yeah. And me and Burb and, and working with you, uh, you guys is, um, is the process of trying to develop language and the communication uh, that other people can use and so on and so forth in, in, in those types of situations, whether it be a therapeutic setting or an interpersonal setting outside of such, uh, such a thing. Um, uh, well, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And I think that, that oh, you know, that's a huge, that can be a huge challenge, both developing the verbal skills, but also to me, this, this other part, and you know, you guys tell me, of course, what, you know, what you think, that there's has to be some trust required that this person would adjust or would care or wouldn't uh react in some negative sadistic way just, yeah or just think you're cra essentially to put it simply think you're crazy exactly think you're you're nuts uh they'll try to because uh, uh, sometimes too is the the person that is in this kind of place this abstract space all the time when they try to bring up these thoughts or their emotional concerns pertaining to it one like i mentioned before it often gets pathologized right two uh, it also um um, it turns into like, a, uh, uh, it, it feels as if the other person is trying to not gaslight you, but that's how it feels. It feels like, um, because the person that's speaking with you is in a different uh, equidistic realm and they're trying to connect it to that. And they're trying to tell you, oh no, it's not this. It's about this. Oh, you're taking it there because you're actually avoiding this, or this is what we should be talking about. And that can confuse the person hearing it uh, that's like me and feel like we're, we're, they're attempting to gaslight us into thinking something that we're not thinking or feeling, right? Even if that's not the intention of, of, the, of either the therapist or the individual that's talking to, right? It could, it could be perceived as manipulative, even if it's not trying to be. Well, I had a couple of thoughts and questions. I'm not sure the right order for them. Uh, but I want to differentiate between the role of a therapist and the role of a, a partner or a mate or a friend. And that I think it's really useful, well, with everybody, but certainly with a partner, that people can find a partner that can tolerate them drifting away. And that is something you look for in a partner and that you, once you know, once you know why you're doing it or what you're likely to do, you can orient them to that and I would appreciate that type of orientation. And I'm always reading or going on my phone and drifting away that way. My mm. thoughts continually, uh, here was my question. I was trying to differentiate myself and the process that I go through that other people dislike sometimes. You know, I'm told to get off my phone or be more present with the group or get a, when I was a kid, it was stop reading, pay attention, or I wanted to change the topic because I was bored out of my mind. So there was that. What's the difference between me drifting away 
uh, and sometimes it's because I have an idea that I want to develop and I'm more interested in my idea than what's going on. That's the truth. And other times, it's not just that I find myself drifting away. I find myself drifting away, but I, I kind of know because I'm a therapist and I know myself that um, right now I'm very self-centered and I want to think about this and I don't want to think about that. And I had learned someplace very early in life to not tell people to shut up <laughs> or to insert myself. And I just got very practiced at thinking my own thoughts while whatever. So the first question was, how is that different than what Zoids do? Yeah, it's the differentiating of the, the thing we always talk about, Burb, the, that which is intuitive and natural and that which is intentional and so on and so forth for the individual. So, but yeah, anyway, I'll, yeah, go I'll ahead. Take it. Yeah, I'll take care. I'll see you know what I can do. Know what's yeah, up. see what I can do about that. Um, I can, I'll, I'm going to get out of the theoretical and just speak of my own personal experience with this because I feel like that's going to be more useful and more emotional, right? Um, I, of course, I, you know, as a person who is very interested in things, uh, I'll be having a conversation about one thing and I'll be wanting to move to something else. It's more interesting because I'll get bored, right? That's, that's sort of uh, familiar. Mm -hmm. um, but then, there, but then but I think Zoe drifting is something a little different, <laughs> a little different. Uh, how to describe it? Um, it's a sense of the value of the interpersonal receding. And it's not about an individual, like we don't care about them or something. It's just about the bigness of the world expands and expands and expands and expands out from under us until we're overwhelmed by the hugeness and the absurdity and the potential of all of these things that are happening around us. The interwovenness um, of yeah. everything via yeah. very broad categories yeah. of yeah. yeah, it's it 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 really is like someone gave you a hit of magic mushrooms. Well, that's what I was just thinking. It. I was saying that's like me on LSD when I was just, right. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what. Okay, now now we're real. Now we're getting somewhere really useful. That's really what it's like. It's like you're going about your business, and then here, have some LSD out of the blue, and he's like, "Oh, okay." Right. <laughs> yeah, mine, yeah. Minus necessarily the, uh, you know, the positive symptoms like hallucination right. or anything right. like that. But, but yeah, oftentimes, and, 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 I, and I agree with you, Burb, it's just that like you, uh, there can be moments in which you start drifting off into these thoughts. And sometimes it could come along for some, and I've heard them describe it, come along with things like feelings of depersonalization or feelings of, of disassociating from the moment or the feelings associated to that moment into feelings that's like completely connected it to this kind of meta, uh, kind of yeah. metaverse, uh, if you will, but yeah. it continues. Yeah. For, Any, yeah. yeah, so, you know, it can be, it's a lot of fear, to be honest. It's a, an it's anxiety, a place of loneliness often, and yeah. a place of, it's a place of loneliness and confusion uh, and, and fear. Uh, and the fear is amplified by the other person not following you there, you know, not being able to follow you there. So it's like, it's scary, but it's also a lonely scary. Um, and so then, of course, it's really difficult for you in that state to uh, relate to other people on an interpersonal level, because that interpersonal moment, however valuable it is and was and will be to you in the future, has just been engulfed by this absurd hugeness. Um, but but also I want I want to I want to want to mention this verb. Yeah. It doesn't. It's not always fear and stuff, right? Sometimes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it will be like a positive emotion, right? But it'll be associated to this same abstract level. Yeah, and, I, I can leapfrog right off of that. Yeah, I'm thank you. Because right, right. yeah. let's not all make yeah. it fear and doom. And yeah, well, I mean, I was going from my own personal experience to try to really no, of get course. into it. No, yeah, and my course. personal experience is mostly sheer terror. So, <laughs> but you no, know, there's plenty of other uh, schizoids um, who are more in, fall, fall into places with less anxiety, um, but it's a similar mechanism. So, um, uh, if, and I'm like, I'm sure I'm not sure if anybody here has read intensely into Hegelian dialectics, but the idea basically is that you have uh, a, uh, a thesis and an antithesis, right? And then the two meet, and then there's a synthesis, right? And then that just keeps happening up and up and up into higher levels of abstraction. And it's this sense of um, existential progress, getting closer to God, right? And so there's there's this sense of 
sort of joy and happiness in that state. And so there's, there's plenty of times where schizoids will be pulled out of an interpersonal interaction into something more uh, like that, but they're still being pulled out of the And it doesn't have to go yeah. that far either, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, that, that's how far it can get, right? Yeah. But sometimes it'll just go as far as the, I mean, as far as national concerns or human concerns or what is emotion? What is this? What yeah. is that? What am I feeling? What is this interaction? What is the point of this interaction? Why are we having this conversation? What it, does this yeah. conversation serve a purpose in, in, in the grand schema? We well, yeah, have uh, a more concrete anything. example, like yeah. j- jumping down from the thing that I just expressed. You know, there's a guy in Quora. I, I use him as an example of this all the time that I, that I read. He was long paragraphs explaining what his inner world looks like. And what he's explaining is like, well, technology is getting better all the time and new things are possible that weren't possible before, right? And we're, we're exploring new parts and understanding new parts of the universe all the time. And, and what, what's, the upper, what's the upper limit of that? There is no upper limit. What's it gonna look like in, in 10, 20, 30 years? And he's just in this technological bliss state, you know, flying off of the interpersonal. Um, so it's not, it's, not, it's not all fear, right? Uh, but from, you know, just expressing my own personal experiences, it, it can be very scary. And I'm curious to if either one of you have seen this sort of stuff when you've dealt with clients. Uh, that are diagnosed schizoid. Have you seen them do this sort of thing during a session where they will, maybe as a therapist, you're trying to keep it on a certain plane and then they just, they just shoot off into something else and they get very emotional as well. Uh, even if it's not totally expressed, you could see there's emotion behind their words, uh, even if they're talking about something that seemingly has nothing to do with, uh, with what is happening right then and there, and that is a therapeutic session, right? Have, have you seen examples of that with clients that you've had? Yeah, um, I have. And I think, uh, you know, as a therapist, my goal is not to bring them back or take them out or move them. My goal in that- Very nice to hear. Oh, yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> okay, good. Um, my goal is to look at where are they with them? what's happening, you know, uh, how do, how are they experiencing it? Do they experience themselves as having just flown, you know, to a different sort of stratosphere here? Uh, Is that where they would like to be or stay? Was there something that shifted a couple moments ago that sent that, you know, that, that uh, where they left at that point? Uh, you know, a feeling or a thought, or maybe it's sometimes nothing, you know, uh, and, but oftentimes nothing, <laughs> oftentimes nothing, you know, yeah. and I had a question about something, you know, I really liked what you were saying, Burb, and when you were talking about the upset about when uh, the partner doesn't come with you there. Yeah. I, okay. And I was curious, you know, if, uh, for people who are having this experience, do they usually want the partner to come with them there? Or as part of, you know, yeah. because I think that's a great question. Yes. Looking no, at I it did. as an escape, you I know. I think that's often an individual basis and it depends on the interpersonal, but go ahead. Well, yeah, uh, I think, situation. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. This is a, good, go this is a great, great question. Yeah, really good question. Oh, really good question. So um, depending on the personality structure of the schizoid person, this can vary a lot, right? Because like, so look, I'm a schizoid person who veers, as you might find this ironic, but I veer towards more the histrionic scale in terms of, um, I sort of will default to viewing other people as part of the in-group, as like part of friends or family or like, like people that are cared about and care about each other and also as competent. So I actually will default often towards people being willing and able to help or to follow me, right? Where I want to go um, or to lead me to somewhere better. <laughs> though, right? though, though it yeah. often, that's not what happens, right? Right. So, yeah. So, well, you know, that's often not what happens. Um, but so the, the, the end result for me is that I'll go to that place and then I'll expect the other person to come with me or to want to come with me. And then I'll be like disappointed that they can't or don't or won't. Um, and then that just happens perpetually. I'm just, how perpetually, does the punishment yeah. make you feel? I'm curious. Uh, 
well, I mean, it's always, I mean, it's confusing because it's like, well, I thought we were in group and now we're not. Like I thought we were, you know, so, but then there's also schizoids that are on the other end, as we've talked about. Talking about I, this one? Yeah, yeah, I sort of call it, um, uh, you know, useless object syndrome where they, based on having all these experiences and maybe some, you know, predisposition, they sort of uh, view people as just baseline unable and unwilling. And so they, they just don't expect it. And, okay. and, and I have yeah. to say, I want to clarify. Yeah. I don't want to say that that pessimism, that external pessimism of the competency of their external world, I don't like the idea of it being a pathology. I, in the sense, in the sense that it's an unrealistic assertion that is being made by the person experiencing it. Because honestly, when a individual grows up in an environment that they cannot connect to, that is constantly invalidating them intentionally or unintentionally, invalidating their experience, their thoughts, their emotional connections to the things, which in turn over time make them feel as if they cannot share those thoughts or even connect to emotions themselves, right? Because the emotions become invalidated. So then one disassociates to that set of emotions and those attachments that are not interpersonal, that are in a different place. And so I want to say that they are very perfectly valid feelings um, and situations for them to have developed that they it is a type of trauma that they're enduring include, and this is important to include more sort of permutations here so there's zoids who are a little histrionic and there's zoids who uh, uh, are very closed in this way and stereotypical right and then there's uh, there's zoids who instead of useless object syndrome or in-grouping people, they will outgroup people, right? Where so, and then you get more of these paranoid features where other people are out to get me, right? And so you'll see, you know, you know posts in the server about uh, how, what, how other people are sinister or fake or shallow or, or you know, intending to do me harm in, in, in all these ways, right? And so then you see all of these personality expressions, all of these diverse personality expressions and how to relate to other people all packed in this in the schizoid pack and, and that's right. what's making it interesting too is that um a lot of these personality um well these uh these expressions and these traits are oftentimes in that same abstract realm uh and they manifest in different ways but they're still in that place that we're yeah, always so like, talking so like, about well, i'm gonna so go like ooh, ooh, and interrupt you for a minute because yeah. i don't want to forget and this yeah. is really exciting for me uh i had Good. answered a question on quora something about paranoid personality disorder. I'm not trained to diagnose paranoid personality disorder. I'm not trained in it. And because it was a fair answer, they, people want me to deal with it more. And I thought, well, this is not my training. And the one person that I had with it who was distinct, well, I had more distinctly paranoid people, but one person, he seemed more narcissistic in his paranoia. So to discover it as an um, the paranoia as a subset of schizoid allows me to have some tools to think about it because I had went from having zero tools 20 minutes ago to Berber, yeah. you start speaking and you start mentioning, or maybe it was you on who mentioned paranoia first or whatever. That's what clicked in my brain that maybe I can be more of help because I'm very willing to go into areas where A, I'm untrained and B, I don't know anything about it and C, they're expecting some expertise and me to elucidate and clarify for them where really that's not, you know, I kind of stay within my, my, what I think I might know. The wheelhouse. Yeah. And you expanded it for me that there's a subset of people who are, are having paranoid thoughts based on, well, I knew my schizotypal was paranoid, but et cetera. That, et cetera. That, that's a great segue right there. Yeah. I mean, this is perfect for what we want to talk perfect about. Perfect segue. Of, so, what we're doing right now, when you say like with, when we talk about within the schizoid package, the thing is that what we're trying to talk about here is really a spectrum of cluster A pathology, or it's not pathology. Not pathology. No, 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 no. A Let's spectrum, move. <laughs> a spectrum of a spectrum of cluster A traits uh, that are related to each other, that that come in in all these different in these different and, forms. And we're right? not the first yeah. people to mention this. Uh, I want to clarify that there is something. Uh, even though we have issues with how it's defined in certain aspects, and there's different ways that it's discussed, there's something already understood or known as or talked about as being the schizophrenia spectrum, right? That is a term that already exists and has already been written about. 
Uh, yep. But and, and maybe you want to go into that a little bit for sure. For sure, you. yeah. You know, there's fantasies of the ideal love. There's you know, there's schizoids who jump off of the individual into an ideal into a ideal image, which is almost completely detached from any interaction with that person at all. And then there's similarly um, paranoid paranoid fan pa paranoid fantasies, which are the same thing except the personality value is different rather than in group competence it's out group competence right it's like so this uh the the fantasy of this individual is that they are uh very good at doing something to oppose me and make me miserable right of course mm -hmm. it's also completely detached from what anybody in the general area would agree is actually happening if you ask them right it's abstracted away from from the concrete world and now this is where we start to get into schizophrenia spectrum so the way that i've learned about this is through Sapolsky. And if you read Sapolsky, he'll tell you that if you go to other cultures, you know, like hunter gatherer societies or, you know, and you take a person out of that place and you put them in modern society without any context, people go, oh, that person's schizophrenic, right? Because I mean, there's a certain socially negotiated aspect of reality, right? There's a, so, you know, um, but in that culture, in that specific environment, the person who's schizophrenic is the one who's worshiping the wrong God at the wrong time, hearing the wrong voice of the wrong God at the wrong time, right? Taking, the, basing, I mean, we sort of have to negotiate our perception of reality in, through dialogue and communication with other people. And so I think what we're seeing here uh, is that there's two important factors in this spectrum that we can focus on for this part of the discussion. One is um, blowing out of the concrete environment so that you're computing categories and then rather than, and we've talked about that at length. And the second part is working memory. So working memory is the amount of information that you can nest and compare and negotiate. It's your executive function. Um, and that really is the way, at least in my opinion that people negotiate their reality is nesting your perspective and my perspective and how competent you are and how respected you are. And so, well, if my perspective disagrees with your perspective in some way, well, how likely is it that I'm right and that I'm totally right and you're totally wrong. But if you close in that working memory, right? And we know that stress does this. We know that, and we know that people in schizophrenia spectrum um, have degraded working memory. Because of a lot of stress. Yeah. Well, and also also a genetic predisposition. And yeah. we also, there's some brain scans that show that schizotypals have, have a similar amount of cortical thinning and then schizoids have less, but still some cortical thinning um, and that in the, in the cortex. And this lines up with this idea of a spectrum in terms of most schizoids have enough working memory so that they're abstract, but they can compare perspectives and nest perspectives mm -hmm. to be able to negotiate and stay within the realms of, of what is considered a normal, a more or less normal, yeah, well, no, normal way of, no, not even equidistant, just a, like a normal way of abstracting. So that's like, oh, okay, oh that yeah, person's yeah. just religious. Within a specific just, range, that's right. accept, an yeah. acceptable range yeah. of extraction. But right. so, you know, within, within, so when that, within that community. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but when you come, when you um, turn up the dials on this cortical thinning and you induce more trauma and more stress and that working memory constricts, it becomes really difficult for them to nest their perspective and another perspective, right? And when you can't do that, well, then each step into isolation is also a step out of sync with the way that other people are thinking, right? And then you start getting some thoughts that other people think are quite bizarre, right? Um, so anyway, that's a quick explanation. So, so I, it basically, to, to sum it up more simply, uh, me and Burb uh, and, and others have discussed the idea that that which is categorized as schizoid and the aspects of it that are often referred to as idiosyncratic thinking, eccentric thinking, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then what you find in schizotypal or typal uh, and what you find in, in, in similar uh, types of situations um, is in fact a spectrum of, of, of thinking that could be, can go from low to high functioning. Yeah, and, and high to low functioning. Not, yeah, it's important. Is this is similar not, to like autism. Yeah, this is sense. not a that schizophrenic that people with schizoid are schizophrenic, which was no, like they're they're not, right? Yeah, but they the, don't have they don't have positive symptoms necessarily, yeah. but there well, are I mean, some. Sometimes they do. Sometimes right? they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and depending then, on the level yeah, of stress, 
Yeah. They could. Uh, they and could. Then, okay, I, so, and then, you know, one more part to add to this before we move on to the opening up the discussion again um, is the fact that the negative symptoms from schizophrenia much resemble the negative skim symptoms from schizoid. The come up to or schizophrenia. Schizotypal or yeah, whatever. yeah, much resembles the negative, negative symptoms. Negative symptoms are very and relatable. Then, and then the next part, the interesting part, is that when you medicate schizophrenics to reduce the amount of dopamine, right? With these antipsychotics, they start to look more like schizoids, and the negative symptoms <laughs> yeah. remain, but the positive symptoms go away, right? And so then, I mean, you know, uh, that's what's interesting yeah. about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, yeah. You med you medicate someone that's yeah. schizotypal or something, and then they start just becoming more schizoid. Yeah, they they, uh, they start looking more disassociated, and like their their positive symptoms go away, but they still have all this anhedonia. The, the and, depression's you know, yeah. still there. Really difficult the for them to connect to people there. on the individual level. Yeah, yeah. And it's all and all the anxiety and depression and everything else is still based on these abstract realms of thinking. It's all still there. It doesn't go away. That part doesn't go away because that's an integral part of who they are. It is not a disorder. <laughs> it's the point I'm trying to make too. Well, I mean, it, 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 I just want to clarify before we continue is like, it's a disorder when we use that term as a heuristic for when what's going on with you is causing you to really suffer and hurt and, and you want to get better and you, or you may not want to get better, but you know, mm -hmm. we, we want you to have a better time of it. Right. So look, if you're, if you're having all kinds of positive symptoms and, and experiencing all things that are outside of the norm, but you're not suffering, then I mean, who cares? Like, go on, go have, have fun. You're not causing anybody else to suffer either. It's like, you know, great, but no, you know, so I think that's the point. And what, oh God, just one oh, last thing. Went, anyway, went, you guys talk, you yeah. guys talk. We're going uh, off. On the, well, the, you, yeah. did you want to say your one last thing? Oh uh, so yeah. Yeah. The, the, the last, the last part uh, is that there's some research which suggests that in um, non-Western cultures, um, the expression of positive symptoms uh, is very different. Um, so like not so many voices saying mean things to you, but more like interpretations of voices as in, um, you know, dead family members telling you to clean your room <laughs> and not to be mean to people. Uh, and, and so that's just to finish up what I was just saying. Yeah, that, that, the, that yeah. the positive symptoms can be affected by cultural context by yeah, just, just stress levels having, yeah by like basically everything that would affect somebody's just life in general their culture their gender their um all these other things could in fact or uh, there is evidence that it impacts the way the positive symptoms uh are um are expressed and uh, well, the point there is that if look if you have a person who's um experiencing things that are outside of the norm but they're seem functional and, and happy, then what is there to treat exactly, right? I'll really tell you what there's to treat, yeah. okay? One of the findings, and I could be off, it's what I've read, and there may be more recent findings, but this is more recent than when I studied it, is with schizophrenia, one of the reasons for early treatment and also for educating the family, which can precipitate uh, more uh, breakdown if we want to use a very simple word, is that people lose cognitive functioning with, uh, with multiple breakdowns. So you want to minimize. It's not like they're going into this happy, altered state on shrooms. Is somehow their brain is being negatively affected and their executive functions and their ability to function in the world becomes less and less. And they become infirm in a way, just like physical infirmity. If I continue doing certain physical things, I have a vulnerable back, my back will become less and less useful to me and I will have more and more pain. So the model is if we take away the put down part of, oh, you have a disorder and we just look at it for what it's meant to be is that it, it, if you leave it alone, it gets worse with schizophrenia, not better and not more acceptable. And it's a little scary to me because when I was first studying it, I didn't know about cognitive diminishment. So I thought, well, okay, as long as you can get the person back, everything is fine. Because I've been in the presence of, of friends with schizophrenia, a friend who became paranoid schizophrenic and, um, and different people and had people in my practice and that piece of information changed everything for me. That if I don't, if there's not a way to interrupt this, educate the family, get them on medication, they're going to suffer a cognitive decline. That's the current thinking that I understand. So that to me is a real problem and requires 
ne not necessarily, I mean, it's a free country. People are allowed to be schizophrenic. They're allowed to opt for cognitive decline. But most people don't realize they're going to get, cog they may get, at least the current information that I'm working off, actual cognitive decline that they cannot get back. And that to me, just like I can't get do certain things now with my back, I would have benefited from earlier on with my back being more cautious because I didn't really understand that uh, it could gradually go down a certain path. And I think it's the same thing with schizophrenia and a number of other things. It's just not an alternative reality. It's an actual diminishment of the ability to function. I agree with basically everything you just said about uh cognitive decline um, in the sense that there's, um, we know that traumatic stress um, degrades various areas of the brain. Um, it degrades your hippocampus and your, your recall. It degrades your executive function even further and your working memory um, even further. Um, and in people who are having uh, this sort of loop of um, experiences outside of the norm, which cause significant distress, right? Um, then that makes it even more difficult for them to nest uh, uh, interpretations later on. And then that causes more trauma, which then makes it more difficult to nest interpretations, which causes more trauma and it's a spiral all the way down. Um, I 100% agree uh, there. But there's also, uh, I think what I was saying is not, not so much about, because this is, this is what I'm talking about in terms of laying down the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Like when you see somebody who's in one of these loops, right, it's very obvious that they're in distress and then that distress is compounding and it's degrading their function, right? But then there's also people and in different environments which have different cultures where the out of the norm thinking or the, the thinking that other people don't necessarily uh, share and this is just one example of when you're when you, when you're listening to yourself talk in your head it's not exactly clear whether that's you or someone else in this culture we say that's me but in other cultures they say no that's someone else and which one is correct i i don't know and i'm not really comfortable saying that one is correct or the other the real question is what's that voice saying Right, and if that voice is saying really horrible things to you, um, which are causing traumatic stress, then that will degrade your functioning over time. But if it's yeah, not saying those will things, do that. then then uh, then I'm not so sure that it will cause a cognitive decline. And then the diagnosis of schizophrenia wouldn't really be laid down; it wouldn't really uh, be necessary. Um, so I think the point I was making there um, is that just outside the box out of the norm thinking or strange interpretations of things uh doesn't qualify for this kind of diagnosis right you really need some you need layers of suffering and cognitive decline in order for the diagnosis to even be appropriate that, that's right and it, when you've been with someone who has that even someone who's well controlled and has that uh it, it's a different it, it is very different than just having um other perceptions and even with the question with voice uh voices in your head and what's being amplified and what's god's voice um i can hear both so <laughs> right, yeah. i can hear my own thoughts if if i um if i were stoned one of the ways I would know I, were, I was stoned, I've been given medical marijuana for sleeping and I get stoned whether I want to or not. Sometimes if I don't get the dosage right while I'm sleeping, I can wake up in the middle of the night. And I, the, way, the way that I know that I've woken up in the middle of the night stoned and I'm taking capsules just for, for pain during while I'm sleeping is my thoughts are louder and they are more voice-like. Mm -hmm. I know they're my thoughts. I have a lot of experience in my early years. I'm 77 now when I was in college and I was taking LSD every weekend for many years or some version of it because there was home chemistry involved, not my home chemistry, but whatever chemist made it, you never quite knew sometimes unless you got mushrooms that were dried and freeze dried in a can. And I thought it was really fascinating that I had this way of telling whether I was stoned or not stoned by listening to the voice in my head. And 
when I heard my thoughts more voice-like, I was stoned. And that's originally <laughs> we're talking about psychotomimetics. When they called psychedelics initially psychotomimetics, because they thought it mimicked schizophrenia, there are some aspects to um, that type of experience that probably does in a, a more short-term way. So that was what, what... What's interesting, too, is that somebody can achieve such a state even without... Um, uh, even without necessarily using any kind of substance, right? Some individuals can do that in, say, uh, sensory deprivation uh, chambers and uh, isolation and Here. things of that nature could, <laughs> could, could, could cause a very much the same experience as someone would uh, this amplification of that voice um, without the substances necessarily being involved. Um, and there is a, there's a lot of uh, work on that as well. It's interesting. But, well, um, there, there actually are psychic phenomena, and it's not like I believe everybody's psychic, but <laughs> I think if you meditate enough, you're going to experience occasionally psychic phenomena, whether you want it or not, at least I have, and uh, that's a different voice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so in any case... Um, I, I get what you're saying because I, well, I won't say I get what you're saying. I get my interpretation of what you're saying mm -hmm. is that we're talking now about a range and mm -hmm. that some aspects could be on the schizophrenic side. Like my client who told me he was schizoid and then he had some form of autism and he thought he was closer to the schizophrenic side and he was closer to uh, the more autistic side than in that time. Asperger's, you know, that's yeah. was an interesting yeah. statement to make. And then I have a, over the, I've been seeing people, I guess, since 1974, 1972, maybe when I first started learning therapy, but 74, definitely, that over the time, there are people to me that were made schizoid. Um, they might, they were sensitive souls, but I think they would have been, they have a normal nervous system. I don't think that they, they're on a schizophrenic spectrum doesn't seem like it to me. And the, the therapy is different. Yes, they're dissociated and they're doing a batch of schizoid things. And I have experienced something like that because I've had, a, I had a stepfather and when I was in those four years with the stepfather, my fantasizing increased dramatically, my well-being went down mm -hmm. and my psychological state decreased and I was much more removed and I, into my own hobbies and thoughts um, that nobody shared and that people didn't share at that time. My hobby was leprosy mm. and Jim Bowie's knives. You know, there yeah. were things like Marie Laveau, they were very kind of thing. And I think if I had stayed in that environment, I might have been made more schizoid. And luckily he abandoned me. So I got more, a little more on the borderline end, but I wasn't borderline either. But it's, it's so for me to go through different parenting models and then to be on the streets with no parent, I could see that, you know, I could see myself cycle through adaptations. Uh, One thing that brings to mind uh, to me is the possibility, because if something's a spectrum, uh, it implies a range, right? And so that range can, uh, can uh, differ greatly. So if it is in fact a range, there's a possibility that people that would never be diagnosed, um, say schizotypal or schizoid, or that would just be considered neurotypical might fall in some regards and certain traits into that very range, right? Just like there's people out there that would be high functioning autistic, right? Or they might have autistic traits that wouldn't, wouldn't culminate into a diagnosis of autism, right? So well, Karen and I debate a lot too and talk about because subparts of the personality come out. Excuse me for interrupting, but we were No, I don't care. It before and my dad was a psychopath and my mom had uh, intermittently psychotic with depression, which I want to bring back about to something earlier, but I'll I'll put it to the side now. So just remind me about depression and what um, people bring to it. So um you know, we were talking about how we can have these little pieces in us that uh, sometimes people are unaware of. I'm usually aware of them. Karen's very good at seeing me shift from whichever piece is active in my brain, she's laughing, and 
What happens is a lot of people are very concrete. And when they hear subcells, if you talk about a subself that's, uh, let's imagine there could be a schizophrenic subself or this subself or that, you know, and I make mine into cartoons, they, they will say, oh, she said she had this subself, she is that. And then I'll go yeah. on. Yeah. And, you know, a whole group of people saying Eleanor is this or Dr. whatever. So that's where I'm being careful because we're abstract I'm an abstract thinker Karen's pretty yeah you know big picture and you guys have made a, a, a personality out of abstraction so for me Karen has you know we, we, we've talked about it watched me shuffle through what's the right response what part of my personality do I want on board and that's where I was saying if she had anything to say or about these sub these parts and I'm I'm happy to if if you want want me to share that. Um. <laughs> I <don't get> that. <laughs> I'm just sitting. I'm letting you guys decide. I'm I'm down for anything. Okay. So. Uh, just that there, you know, your thoughts about the, yes, that oh, there can be sub selves in people, and in a more general way, you know, is what I'm talking about. Okay. Yes, uh, I I agree, and I think that people can get really. Uh, sort of concrete and uh, freaked out by a certain title of a disorder, even if it's a sub-self or even having aspects of something that, that, you know, just because a bunch of psychiatrists and psychologists sat around a table and decided these are the 15 criteria for this disorder, here are the boxes for this one, that humans, we don't necessarily fit so neatly into these boxes just because this is what this group of people well, i hate all the boxes personally yeah yeah that more likely uh what most people i think you know you may have a primary where the you know here's the group of themes that mostly apply um or can explain or you know uh or bring context to something someone is suffering with but that most people you know or a lot of people i should say uh, have flavors, a little bit of this, a little bit of, you know, something else. And it doesn't mean you have that, right? Like my mom was talking about, uh, the ability to shift. And I often can, you know, watch her uh, make, um, like she was saying a couple of weeks ago that she shoots from the hip. And I said, no, 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 I don't think you shoot from the hip. You do a very fast calculation in almost instantaneously where I watch her and I can see it like it's uh, magnified to me of pros and cons and immediately does this calculation and shifts accordingly. And, um, you know, it doesn't, have to mean that's all of a person, but you can have an ability or have a part of you that uh, is something else. Um, I wanted to say, and this this is, has to do with your point, Karen, the, the sub personalities and this idea of having different aspects of self. And I know in associating certain terms or categorical terms such as schizoid or schizotypal or whatever to those sub personalities can often be confused by people that are not really understanding what it is that's being portrayed as being oh that's what you are now right and i, I get i get that concern absolutely um but uh what i want to mention is this idea of the reason me and Burr, I, uh, and Burby can interject if you disagree um see, like to see it as a spectrum is because we feel that it is a a innate part of the human experience to have individuals on these with, with traits that kind of delve into all these aspects of this what we like to perceive from autism to uh to i guess a schizotypal or low function schizotypal sort of spectrum right that there's people that have whether you want to think of sub personalities or pieces of that and they dabble in this and dabble in that that there are individuals that have more over here on this side or over here on that other side that affect their ability to interact with their external environment which is generally more equidistant or has a mixed bag of traits it's kind of more at, in the average or in the center I'll, right? I'll interject and try to 
credit like yeah, that what you're yeah, yeah. like at. we're the outliers yeah. of that spectrum someone like me uh, someone like yeah. her is so let's, kind of a, you know yeah. so there's um huh, there's there's one thing i was going to say before which is to angst, what to angst, to what angst was saying um earlier and to what to what I, my purpose was in terms of bringing up um ex positive symptoms in other cultures um so let's say that you have a predisposition towards cluster a so you have a trait or what's considered a. to be cluster yeah. a because we have yeah. issues with yeah. clusters to begin yeah. with yeah. and 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 that and that can veer towards uh, a potential schizophrenia diagnosis under the right conditions um let's say that you have like a severe predisposition um if the environment is set up for you in such a way as to make up for your deficits and keep you nested and grounded and and all these things then um it even if you have this intense predisposition it may not ever manifest in a way where you're suffering and declining um, Ooh, mention the the example that you had earlier when we were talking about someone that say has a strong autistic predisposition that okay, sure. you know the sensory yeah. and so on yeah so um so let's say that you have a okay okay I'll, I'll, here's how i'll do it so there is um this common thing that happens in the diagnosis of autism where um a child is born um and then you have a surge of cortical overgrowth the opposite of cortical thinning associated with schizophrenia by the way interesting but um and so what will happen is that they'll be taken through the world as if they're a normative child by default the person never the parents never act never think well they might be autistic right until the damage has already been done so they the kids have this overgrowth they're becoming extremely sensitive to their environment and the parents are moving them around from activity to activity from place to place going on adventures going out in the world and this kid's brain is overloading and then it manifests with the kid banging his head against the wall and then they go oh something's wrong well no something was different before and then the action that you took led to this result and if there had been more care in figuring out you know well exactly and, what kind and, of and we're not assigning yeah. um malignance or malevolence yeah. on the part yeah, of the yeah. parent figure or anything like that it's just it's just about not no access to information it's like we don't know what kind of kid this is going to be before he expresses or she expresses herself in the world um and so so that that's an, that's an example in, in autism um but again if you go to the if you if we go back to cluster a and, and these expressions and talking about this drifting off and not having language if there's preparations made if there's an environment set up um if and this is the other culture part if there are interpretations of uh strange sensory experience um which are less pathologized less stigmatized um more more open more appreciated more uh talked about more expressed um then then a person that would have been predisposed to a very severe uh, uh, diagnosis in one environment can thrive in another one. Um, so, and so then that gets us into this, what Inks was just talking about in terms of the, the spectrum of human cognition and why we have people who are like this versus like that. And so, if, well, if you think about it in the context of um, our evolutionary environment, it really pays to have people in your group, in your family group, and we lived in groups of like 70, 80, you know, maybe smaller, um, that are sort of up in trees, metaphorically and literally, paying attention <laughs> to what everybody is doing and then what people are doing in the other tribe over there, right? And just watching all of these without necessarily engaging. Um, it really pays to have that kind of person because if you need to know something that's happening in a different domain, if you need, if it's really important that you jump out of your concrete activities to notice a threat, uh, these people are gonna let you know. So it's really adaptive to have these people around. Uh, I, want, I want to interject. Um, so uh, just to kind of ground a little bit uh, in a more equidistant sort of way, I guess what Bird was saying in that part, in my opinion, is that there is a place for people like this as we are discovering that um even in business and everything they're discovering that say people that are neurodivergent people that are like more high functioning or or even autistic in some capacity that they have certain skill sets and abilities um that are more conducive to specific types of work uh and can be a part an integral part of society 
and uh, in a very in, in, in certain specific realms that are actually more comfortable contextually to those individuals, right? It's not just, oh, they're useful uh, in this or that setting. It's also they're comfortable in this or that setting. They're happy or in this and that setting. But at the same time, it's conducive to something that would be, I guess, societally productive, right? Oh, and, and that, but that changes how we perceive people, right? Because mm -hmm. what so absolutely if you, have, if, you, yes. if you have an autistic person who's really good at something, right? Who's who's who had an environment that was set up for them from the beginning, so that they zoomed in on something, and now they play a critical role in in this activity. Um, the kind of engineering that, or yeah, something mathematical, the or something. That they're going to get labeled. Oh, you're autistic and dysfunctional. No, they're just Jeff. Like they're not autistic. They're just that guy who does that thing. Um, and yes. so the, I think. The sky is the limit in terms of the more language we have for these different ways of being and the more prepared we are as a culture, as people are born um, to just, instead of directing them just to wait and see who they are before we set up the environment for them. Um, the people that would be diagnosed and dysfunctional and in pain and suffering will become useful functional members of society just sort of behaving and and, and, and more yeah. importantly they would not be as miserable and hurting uh, it's very interesting what you're saying and i just want to know from my point of view i would like to see a much more level playing field and that people's differences be respected any kind of difference and that there's room for everybody and that we don't have to pathologize differences there are certain differences that need treatment because it's going to be detrimental to the yeah. person and whether we have the right uh, preparation for them or not, it's already a fact, like you're saying, Verb, that when they, when people um, have the appropriate understanding, they do much better, including people with schizophrenia. There's all sorts of uh, work on that. And there's also the cross-cultural stuff that I've read. So I would just like to find, um, and, and also the point that interested me that you brought up, was you know dragging the kid from activity to activity when they're overloaded and so there's certain ability in teaching parents to tune in more to their individual child and we don't get that much in this society we get no, we do not you know so that is the thing that we're really talking about distress being aware and, and, and not pushing someone to the side. Oh, we don't have to tune into them because they're not normal. So yeah. they have to be treated so that they can tune into us. And I think that model isn't working very well. And I think that's what you're talking about. That is, as soon as you find a difference then they have to go to treatment to get rid of the difference, minimize the difference so that whatever, instead of looking, what's that difference good for? Absolutely. And though it's lacking um, still, there is progress being done in that department for, say, something like autism. And what we are positing is that there is another side to this that isn't being discussed. There is another side to the spectrum that is being even more uh, invalidated, neglected and misunderstood. And that's that's kind of the theory and idea that we're positing here that has to do with this other form of thinking that starts from early childhood and onward that can be negatively, it, what, what's negatively impacting their life is their environmental situation, not being attuned in any capacity to that type of individual. Uh, and I, I, think, uh, I think that's something important to bring up. Karen, uh, any thoughts? Um, sorry, we've been talking too much. No, no, I, you know, I think, um... Uh, well, it's a know, lot. It's a lot. <laughs> I, agree, I agree with you know with with a lot of what you're saying, and you bring up really some really good points. And that I think <clears throat> what I see with my clients who are both uh, you know either on the autism spectrum or neurodivergent and schizoid is that not only are there uh, sort of innate uh, uh, way of being or or perceiving or experiencing is sort of ignored and say you know the you know if we're thinking about that child dragged from activity to activity there's also you know i think we were talking sort of slightly differently about this but referencing it at the beginning where they're also punished for not being the square peg in the square hole so there's you know punishment when they're not fitting into something else that they couldn't anyway, 
Um, and there's often the lack of interest in, well, uh, how, what are they interested in? How are they perceiving things? What is their experience? You know, that, uh, you, you know, there's, so I think that that part is also missing on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that part is also internalized um, in terms of the person then being confused about one, whether their interests or preferences matter, whether they have interests or preferences. Do their emotions matter? Well, exactly. And uh, for many clients, you know, learning about SPD and learning about, you know, having this realization, oh, I think I'm on the spectrum can be so validating um, to what they're experiencing rather than they're just wrong or different somehow, mm -hmm. you know, being the earlier message that they were given by these experiences. Shame, I think, is a really good subject to bring up here because I don't think we've really touched it just really quickly. I, I would just want to know, because I know we have to wrap it up pretty soon here, but I would just want to know in your personal experiences working with clients, what are some of these, what, what does shame often look like? What sort of shame, where is shame coming from, from what you can perceive when it comes to your schizoid uh, clients or neurodivergent clients in that sense? Um, how do they express their shame? What, where is it stemming from in your opinion? Okay, so what, like, I don't know if you, if you wanted to add something, Mom, or if you want me to continue, but. No, I, whoever, okay. I, you, it's to you guys. You guys interrupt each other all you want. So right now okay. you guys talk. Okay, one of the things I see a lot with my schizoid clients is what I call the boomerang, which is that somehow the shame, with the shame they've internalized, everything comes back to how it's their fault. Even if it starts out with anger or hurt or resentment towards someone else, the gist of the story comes back to somehow how they're all bad or it's all their fault um, for a number of reasons, you know, depending on the person, this can be um, for one person, it actually gives them more of a sense of control that if it is their fault, then that means in theory, they would have the ability to affect this for change, even if they don't feel able to or want to at this moment. It's also that in order to uh, maintain some positive emotional attachment to their parents and whatever their circumstances were growing up, that they could see the parents as still being good in some ways and attached, and just, and, but they internalized that they were bad. Um, and that, you know, if they're having a reaction, and also sometimes they're told this or punished, you know, that if they feel upset, there's something wrong with them. The, the parent is sort of like Teflon where uh, the problem is with the child, somehow not adjusting well enough to whatever the environment is. And, the, you know, that can lead to tremendous shame that if they have a problem, if they have a feeling, if something is painful, if they, uh, something doesn't go well, that ultimately it somehow all comes back to how they're bad. In or, their the, or, or even better yet, and this is what um, something that always concerns me is sometimes even within the language of psychology, often I hear they are, they have some empty or broken core or something. They're damaged in some capacity. Um, and if they associate that damage or emptiness or brokenness to their actual self, to their sense of who they are, if, you know, when we discuss this kind of cognitive differences, if they associate it to that, um, they pathologize their internal experience and emotions, that, le that leads to a fracturing of an, a sense of self, in my opinion. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like if we pathologize someone that's autistic's experience as something that's incorrect about them, because it's not in line with what should be human behavior, um, then that in itself causes a deep amount of trauma in wounds. Um, it, it, uh, but anyway, sorry. I want to, I want to talk on the, um, everything is my fault, right? Um, 
that's, if we talk about expanding earlier, we talked about um, sort of viewing other people as useless objects. We talked about viewing other people as competent threats, add incompetent threats, and then you get this sort of disgust where, you know, it's like other people are like cockroaches to you. It's like, yeah, they're, they're a threat, but they're not a competent threat. So you feel like stepping on them, right? And then there's this other thing, which is um, the internalization of, uh, it's like, um, it's like almost an inverted outgroup on the self, right? It's like core aspects of my being are conflicting with everything that's good about the world, right? These parts of me that exist are almost conceptualized as enemies. Um, and then you might see um, self-harm. Um, and so that's just sort of furthering this idea that all of the different personality expressions that we encounter in, uh, in quote unquote normative individuals uh, are there within the schizoid person. Um, and the schizoid uh, way of thinking itself is none of these things, right? It's the schizoid way of thinking isn't um, being conditioned to distrust. It isn't um, being conditioned um, to you view, to be self-sufficient or to view other people as as not useful or um, to view yourself as uh, have this antagonistic relationship with yourself, right? Um, these are all the personality expressions that fit within a schizoid person, but the schizoidness is not that, um, which is something that I think often a lot of clinicians get confused about, right? Is there um, they're going, oh well if we could just help you to see that other people can be trusted, then all of your problems would go away. And all of these defense mechanisms that you've built up in terms of quote unquote intellectualizing, well, you wouldn't need those anymore, right? Because, right? But that's just, it just couldn't be further from the truth as we're talking about right here is that there really is a, there's a, there's a spectrum of deep innate difference. And if you're, if you're just a little bit towards that spectrum, um, then you know the right conditions might push you uh, to live through that subpersonality primarily. But it's not your only subpersonality, right? But you know, the the closer you get to that side of the spectrum, the easier it is for you to go there, right? And it's not so much easy; it's inevitable at a I mean, certain for point. it to impact yeah. every aspect of the many parts that make you you. Um, because it's, it's, it's something more innate in comparison to other things that develop through your environment and such. Uh, Eleanor, uh, uh, like I said, we have to wrap this up, but I, I want to get some words from Eleanor too uh, on this. Well, we do. About innate and myself and where I am on the things. And I realized that one of the di disconnects between me and some of my schizoid friends is that, uh, is this abstraction. I can abstract for a purpose. I'm a pragmatic abstractor. I can pull back so I can see the whole board and what's movable and what's not movable and chart a path through the forest. So I abstract for a particular purpose usually. It's goal-oriented. Yeah, it's a goal-oriented purpose and um, you know, it, 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 it's temporary. And once I realized I lose interest when people go up very abstract, even very simply, like I'm not made up, and I can see the positiveness of it for a scientist, for example, to be able to go with what verb you were talking about, you know, and, and go very, very meta on things like that. And I don't think I have a very scientific mind. I have a very logical mind. But when we get into these discussions that for me are not personally pragmatic, like, um, you know, what is the meaning of life and can humans do basic and this, I lose interest, like <laughs> rapid loss of interest. So I, I was thinking earlier on with a friend of mine who combines that abstraction and he wants to talk about the meaning of life and he feels despair, I don't want to go with him. And early on with, with having someone to come back to uh, who will accept you, I'll accept that he goes there on his free time, mm -hmm. but I don't want to hang out 
there with him. Yeah, and you shouldn't have to if you, you don't because want to. Some of it frightens me, the despair part. That's why I said, remind me of depression. When depression is combined with the abstraction and the meaningless of life, I don't want to go there. That's some fun time nihilism. Yeah, so I don't want to, you know, some people, and, and some people are very happy to find other people to go there with them, but I'm not that person. Useful for me to hear about adding things to the abstract, that mm -hmm. pragmatic me, I'm very, very, very pragmatic, that, that gives me some way of grasping what direction will be useful to my clients to go in. And so I want to thank you for that. Uh, all right. Uh... If I think that's good, Burb, anything before we shut down here? Good. I mean, I basically said everything not as well as I would have wanted, but I did my best. Burb, you never done. say everything as well as you would have wanted. So that's not OCPD talking, but. <laughs> Which I do have. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want and... to something on, on camera with you just as an idea, because it's something that Karen and I have kicked around forever, and that's the concept of a narzoid. And whether that's a worthwhile concept, whether it exists, whether it's a misperception, um, for another time. Oh that's... yeah, for sure. I, I, I we're leaning toward some misperception there, in my opinion. But yes, I, so, that so would be. A, yeah, no, we, no, let's not get into it because we got in. But that would be a really good conversation. That would be an, another conversation yeah. we can absolutely have, and let's kick that can around uh, in the future. Thank that you. was really, really fun. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate you being here, Eleanor. I appreciate you being Karen. Um, Verb, I don't have to say I appreciate you being here because you don't care. Um, and, <laughs> and nobody has to tell me they appreciate you being here either because I don't care. Um, so so I'm meeting in the middle in that sense. People like to hear those things. Uh, also, uh, if anybody enjoys these conversations, uh, if they want to see more of them, please, this is the part where I shill because uh, I'm broke. Uh, please join uh, me on Patreon. That supports the project, that supports me, it supports my efforts, makes it so I can spend more hours and more time doing this instead of doing all that other type of work that the world wants to drag me into and I don't care about. So, um, well, they don't want to drag me into it. In fact, I can't even find a job. But in any case, um, please support me on Patreon. Please support me on PayPal. Donate, donate, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And if you uh, are schizoid out there or self, well, if you've self-diagnosed, we have a vetting system over there, but if you're a diagnosed schizoid out there, especially, come uh, to the server. It's on Discord. It's called the Zoid Void. You can go there. We have a community of people that know how to that discuss things on this kind of plane and are comfortable there and aren't judged and aren't chained by this sort of thinking. You could be incredibly pessimistic or otherwise, if that's how you are, that's okay. That doesn't matter. You want to be totally abstract pessimism, you want to be nihilistic, go, come, come join, join. If that's, if you're worried other people don't like it, that will be fine. That's normal there. Uh, that's pretty chill. Nobody cares. Um, in any case, thank you for everyone watching and blah, blah, blah. Uh, thank you. We're done. Thank okay. you.